Welcome back to D-Web Decoded, your guide to navigating the decentralized web. In today's episode, we're joined by DSI Labs, Philip Collinger, and Chris Hill. DSI Labs is using the Filecoin and IPFS tech stack to create a more open, credible, and impactful framework for conducting scientific research. But before we dive into the conversation, I'd like to take a moment to highlight several upcoming events across the Filecoin ecosystem. September 6 and 7, we have Phil Soul, which is hosted by Secured Finance and is part of Korea Blockchain Week. It features tracks for both storage providers and developers. September 11 through 15, we have Phil Dev Summit happening in Singapore, with another edition happening at September 25 through 27 in Iceland. October 3rd through 5th, we have Phil Vegas, which is a storage provider focused event featuring keynote speakers Mark Yusko and Kyle Samani. November 14th through 16th, we have the Filecoin network phase happening at DevConnect in Istanbul. Now over to our conversation with Philip and Chris from DSI Labs. So we're here today with Philip and Chris from DSI Labs. Great to have you guys here. Hey, thanks for having us, Hi, Aaron. Great to be here. Amazing. So Philip, why don't you just give us a, a quick intro to yourself and then uh, we'll turn over to Chris. Yeah, so uh, I'm Philip. I'm a professor in economics at the Free University in Amsterdam and a co-founder of DSI Labs and the president of the DSI Foundation. And before I embarked on this venture to start DSI together with Chris and Sina, I've been doing a lot of interdisciplinary research uh, in economics and psychology, in complex trait genetics, also a little bit in neuroscience and epidemiology. And the basic theme there that, that connected all of that was big data uh, and reproducibility. Great. And Chris, what's your story? Yeah, so I'm Chris. So um, I trained as a scientist. I did a PhD in neuroeconomics where I worked in interdisciplinary fields. Um, I had quite a successful PhD, but I did realize how broken the system was and I did leave for entrepreneurship. So I started different businesses and I was very fortunate uh, to meet Philip uh, in quite an extraordinary story and uh, to co-found DSI Labs with him. As, a, as, as my way of uh, giving back and addressing some of the systemic challenges that are faced by the scientific record. Amazing, amazing. So we'll dive into some of those challenges today as well as the work that you guys are doing. Uh, but first, let's, let's dive into what's the origin story of DSI Labs? Like, what are the, the problems you guys are trying to solve? And then what is, kind of how did this all come together? How did you end up uh, working together on this? Philip, you want to yes, kick off here? Or whoever wants to kick off, go for it. Okay, okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll give my rendition. So, uh, so it was during the height of the COVID epidemic. Um, Philip and I didn't know each other. We were both seeking some freedom and uh, we ended up in Mexico and we met on a rooftop terrace in a beautiful uh, seaside place. And uh, we had a spontaneous conversation that day around uh, reproducibility and research. And we realized that we had not only, you know, that was a team that was very close to our hearts, the problem that our reproducibility and replicability in the scientific record, the adverse incentives that scientists face in their careers. And we bonded on these, on these uh, um, very important issues. And then we decided to stay in touch and we ended up actually building out this thing together. And a couple of weeks in, we already had, you know, uh, um, all sorts of different uh, slide decks and and uh, resources yes. we, we used to like really bootstrap this idea from nothing to something. So, so that was the so, original story. So, we like the very... lesson, so the, like, sounds like the lesson in there is that if you're an entrepreneur looking for a co-founder, you should hang out at a rooftop bar in Mexico. <laughs> and... the, lesson is, the lesson is like, uh, if you're an entrepreneur looking for a co-founder, I think you should look uh, find places where people are seeking freedom and new ideas, right? And this is where you're most likely to find them. So Philip, what's your rendition? Well, I mean, I remember this rooftop party very, very vividly. I remember that we had a Berlin DJ there, that the sunset was amazing. And then when Chris and I started talking to each other, it turned out that actually his PhD supervisor is one of my co-authors. So then, uh, you know, we were immediately like, oh, how is that possible? And then uh, we started talking and we very quickly realized that we were actually frustrated by many of the same problems in science, including the, you know, the, the raging replication crisis that we have in many empirical fields. Also, you know, the, the lack of uh, reproducibility of research that a lot of data and, and code is not accessible, which makes it impossible for people to check uh, how the authors came up with the results that they're claiming in their paper in the first place, 
the bureaucracy, the you know, the, the funding problems, all of that. We were just, you know, we were we were basically just really connecting about all our our experiences in the uh, in that world. And then Chris started pitching this idea to me that maybe we could use these emerging technologies from the decentralized web to address some of these problems. And I must honestly say that I was originally very, very skeptical. So I thought like, oh, this is all just a crypto scam and like, mm -hmm. but I thought also Chris is a really smart man and I'm just going to listen to him and like, we're just going to talk this through and see where this goes. And it went very, very quickly to me realizing that there is a lot of potential uh, and then actually having, you know, the, the motivation, but also uh, the guts to um, to basically quit my job as a professor. Back in the days, I was uh, at UW Madison, and yeah, so I had to quit that quit that job and uh, and go full time with uh, with design. Amazing, amazing. Uh, so let's dive into kind of the core problems that you're you're. I mean, this could probably be its whole another a whole episode just in itself, right? Kind of diving into some of the problems <laughs> of science. But if you were to summarize these into maybe a, a few bullet points and 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 elaborate on them a bit, uh, particularly the replication crisis, it, it's, it seems to me that this is a problem that's fairly well understood within science. Like you talk to any scientist, and they'll they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Not so well understood in the general public, and perhaps people that rely on science, to, like make decisions, <laughs> right. they, you know, they might yeah. want to know some of these things. Right. Um, so maybe Chris, let's go to you. When we talk about this idea of the, the replication crisis, like what are we referring to? Yeah. Yeah. So we're referring to essentially the fact that scientific studies today, and many of them do not replicate. So what does replication means? That means you can take, you can essentially collect data, you can follow the methods of the original author. You can reanalyze that data. And ideally, you should be able to re replicate the results. That means your results should be coherent with the results of that initial study. So in other, in other words, if a study doesn't replicate, right, what does that mean? Right? That can mean a whole lot of things. Right? You could have methodological errors. You could have ways in which that uh, second study wasn't correct, uh, conducted correctly. But most often, what it means is that the original study was, was flawed. Right? And there's all sorts of reasons you know, that we can dive into why these, these, uh, um, these replication issues happen, like questionable research pr practices, garden of forking paths, p-hacking, all of the types of problems around that, underpowered studies. You know. mm -hmm. But these are essentially... It's all about the robustness of the scientific record, right? So today we use peer review to certify that a particular research output is trustworthy, quote unquote, right? That is our certification process. That certification process relies on examining the manuscript, right? So you have a typically like a PDF or a document that you go through line by line. You examine the arguments made by the authors. You test, you, you check whether the results and the data support the conclusions that your authors have arrived with, right? And that is essentially the, the basic process of peer review. And um, the big problem is that peer review today ignores some of the most fundamental markers of trust in the scientific record. Namely, if your code is available, if your data is available, if your work is internally reproducible, if your work has been pre-registered, so pre-registration pre is an entire chapter of, uh, of, of meta-science in a sense, right? But all of these things are incredibly important. And the current scientific infrastructure does not support validation or verification of these types. And that leads to a cascading problem. So you have famous cases in which, for instance, the company Amgen was uh, attempted to, to replicate many top uh, uh, rated studies in, uh, uh, in, in the medical field. And they had replication failure rates. And these were papers that were taken from the top journals of the field, right? They had replication rates, which were in the 90%, right? If I remember correctly, Philip. Yeah, yeah and exactly. Yeah, they, they could uh, basically replicate about 5% of the, of the uh, landmark papers in, in cancer research that they were trying to use as the, the starting point for drug development. 5%. Like the rest was wow. not replicable by them. They, they wasted, I don't know how much money, but they definitely wasted a lot of money for basically trying to figure out if there is anything in these studies. And it turns out there wasn't. And 
and so this what you're saying is like this isn't just I mean, this is one example, high profile example, yep. but this is yep. not an edge case by any means here. This is this is generally no. like I mean, how much how much research out there in in just the overall body of scientific work like like is estimated to to be <laughs> Un, unable to be replicated essentially is there, this is one of the you're most laugh, you're, you're laughing here right. is, like, like how right. much how much how many if i read 10 scientific papers like how many of them are like i think a useful heuristic is a coin flip um coin flip. because we don't, know, <laughs> <laughs> we don't know the base rates right in order to get a base rate of the replicability of published research you would need to randomly draw within the corpus of published studies right and 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 do large-scale replications and remember there's something interesting about replications is that they are held to a higher standard than original studies why because you need to have higher sample sizes typically right in order to convincingly be able to claim that something doesn't replicate, right? Yeah. So not only are they, they costly to undertake, they require large sample size, they require typically multi-lab collaborations, which is one of the things that's been pioneered by USF with the many lab uh, uh, study setup that they've done, right? And so, and so they're costly, they're under-recognized, they're very difficult to undertake. And today we don't have robust estimates for what are the base rates of replicability across different fields right, right. and it's one what of the most know, questions. I, I think hmm. what we uh, what we do know however is um how well studies from particular fields that were published in top journals replicate so uh, there have been an, a number of attempts from uh, from meta scientists to look into that and uh it looks like just like Chris said, that in uh, in most fields, uh, the, the replication rates are about 50%. So some fields are worse. Uh, for example, cancer research, preclinical research, unfortunately, is, is one of the fields that has one of the worst replication records that is out there. Um, and some fields, they're much, much better. Uh, so economics, I think my discipline, I think they had replication rates of maybe 60 or 70% of the papers that got published in, in real top journals. And I'm pretty sure that there's fields out there that are even much better than that. But yeah, it, okay, is, a, but it is a very serious problem. But even, I mean, even like 60, 70% is still, like if you ask a random person on the street, like how much of, how many scientific, what's the replication rate of scientific studies? Like would you argue, most people would probably assume that, oh, if it's a peer reviewed journal, it's probably like, 90 percent all of them yeah, 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 yeah. You know, exactly. or like 10 percent no, as long well, as peer no. reviewed it must be legit right? <laughs> so that's so i i think that's that's particularly interesting just given the fact that there's this seems to be a very widely acknowledged problem within the scientific community but like outside outsiders who are potentially using this research really have it's not well known at all that this is even an issue right yeah. so i think that's that's an interesting problem um and i would like to talk a bit about you know the the maybe perhaps like the motives of the science of the researchers the scientists mm -hmm. that are they're producing these and, and just because a, a study is not replicable necessarily for for some of the reasons you mentioned like maybe that the data isn't available the underlying code isn't available uh or it's not if it's maybe it's not necessarily like that the, the researcher is like hiding it and keeping it a secret but it's just like unable to be accessed by the person who would want to be reproducing the study um but then there's also uh you know there's just fake science that's out there that that is yeah that is with basically a malicious motive of they're just being paid to write a paper drawing X conclusion. And uh, so you don't necessarily know the motives of, of you, you find this study that is irre, uh, irre, 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 irreplicable and you don't necessarily know the motives of like, is this person just uh, being paid to show something or is, did they just, did they do this in good faith? They just didn't, you know, we just can't access the data. Like maybe talk a bit about that, that, that discrepancy there. Yeah, I think one, one first point to, to mention is just the distinction between replicability and reproducibility, because they're important. Um, reproducibility is, let's say, you know, you put out a study and that study is internally reproducible because it contains the raw data, the process data, the code that has been used to do these transformation that ultimately led to the scientific results, right? Mm -hmm. And reproducibility, arguably, is the first step to replicability, right? Replicability mm -hmm. okay. involves gathering a distinct data set, right? A distinct, a new data set and reapplying the methods of the original authors to obtain the same conclusions, right? So we actually, the scientific record suffers from a dual crisis, right? Mm -hmm. It's a crisis of reproducibility. What does that mean? That means research outputs 
are not verifiable. You literally have to trust what they say. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. replicability is a different issue, right? And they're, but they're deeply interconnected in a sense yep. because the incentives in science do not reward me for creating reproducible research. And they do not reward me as a, as a scientist in a very, very competitive uh, 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 professional job market for creating you know, replication studies either, right? So when you think about it, it's a dual crisis. It's both reproducibility and replicability. And the incentives of the system uh, hamper these types of advances that are necessary to build a robust scientific record. Can we double click on this incentives point? I think this is a this is an important one to 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 kind of hammer home because obviously, look, like we live in a world where people respond to the incentives that are presented to them, uh, irregardless of their profession, and uh, these these issues of reproducibility, replicability have been around for a long time, and there's obviously some kind of system that's been perpetuated here based on you know the there's incentives that are like aligning to keep this system perpetuating essentially. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I I love that line. I, I want to say something about it. It's like like the word incentive is being, you know, a, a lot of time we hear this word over and over as a reason not to do anything about it. It's like, oh, the incentives are against it. There's no way we can change anything. The system is doomed. You have no hope, right? You hear this, right? This type of discourse. So I think it's really, really important here to, discuss, to, to essentially understand that incentives are upstream of infrastructure which are themselves upstreams of community norms, right? And the funders ultimately are the ones that pay for the research grants, that the institutions provide jobs to scientists. And ultimately it's a very complex systems with a lot of interlinked element. But if the infrastructural piece is not there, you, then you cannot, you, you simply cannot create new systems that could pr- produce a more reliable and more incentive compatible scientific record. So, um, yeah, it's my so two what, cents around. So what does that those. look like for like, if, if, if me, if I'm just, if I'm an average scientist in a, in a university someplace and I'm, I'm trying to kind of, you know, climb the, the, you know, the prestige ladder, the career ladder, like what are, what are my incentive? Like, what are the incentives I'm trying, what are the carrots I'm kind of following after here, essentially? Like I want to get, right. you know, I want to get my research into a peer reviewed journal. I want to get funding grants from, uh, from the government or from the, from, from a donor, like what are kind of the, the carrots that I'm, that I'm chasing after? That's exactly it. So, um, academia is actually a very, very competitive market. So it's very difficult to uh, get into it. It is very difficult to make advances in, uh, in it. And just like you say, so the, the carrots, the, the things that you're being evaluated on ultimately in most fields and most departments, they boil down to, how much have you published? So basic count of like, you know, how many papers, how many books, then where have they been published? How prestigious are these outlets? Then they also look at how many citations that you get. So, right. So what, what is the impact that your work had on the field? And then of course, the big question, how much money were you able to bring in and how much overhead were you able to, uh, to flush into the university's, um, you know, wallets. Uh, these are all things that you're ultimately evaluated on. And then, yeah. of course, you know, they also look at teaching records and things like that. Uh, but for research, it really boils down to you have to publish a lot and you have to publish in glam journals. Uh, and that is decidedly different uh, or like this decidedly not the same as doing good science. Hmm. So the, the incentives are are much more aligned toward, you know, just, just pumping out as much as you can and yep. hoping you get yep. one of the, one or two of these things land into a major journal, hoping it gets yep. picked up and it gets cited by somebody, yep. but it, the incentives yeah, exactly. do not really, you're not necessarily being rewarded for, for producing a, a study that is both reproducible and, and replicable in any meaningful way. Exactly. And, and when you, how it works. Exactly. And when you think about it, like from, from the perspective of an editor of a scientific journal, right? So they, they typically try to make their journal uh, more prestigious. They, they try to increase the impact factor that uh, the journal has, right? So in, within each field, uh, you have a certain number of, of journals and you can rank them basically by their impact factor or by their prestige. They're, they're very uh, uh, tightly interlinked with each other. So what the editors are doing when they evaluate work is they're asking themselves, 
So what's the chance that this particular article will get a lot of citations very, very quickly? And in most cases, that will be the type of work that is attention grabbing, where you're doing, you know, things that are, um, you know, unexpected, where you're doing things that nobody has done before. But, you know, if these sorts of things, like if, if you do things that nobody has done before and you get unexpected results, there's also an intrinsic chance that you've just done something wrong. Mm. But this is not what these journals actually check for, right? So they, they check for whether it's attention grabbing enough and whether it's, you know, whether it's novel enough, whether it makes a big enough contribution. And of course they look at the methods and of course they, there's a lot of arguments about, you know, whether, whether the results um, and how they're being interpreted are being supported by the data and so on and so forth. But ultimately the, the editors and the, um, the referees in most cases do not have access to the raw resources, to the raw data and, and code to actually check these claims. So they just have to believe the authors and there's uh, debates about whether they use the right re regression method or, you know, whatever. Uh, but it doesn't go down to the level where you can actually double check the results. Got it. Got it. And, and so kind of tying a bow on this, this segment here. So this is a, these, these, these are problems that are well acknowledged uh, within the scientific community. Yes. Uh, it, this is obviously problematic because how are you going to just advance the scientific cause if, if, this is if the, the, kind of your fundamental research is not really verifiable. Um, and over, over the last couple of decades, it seems like there's been quite a bit of movement within the scientific community toward, uh, you know, the fair open data principles, uh, which we'd, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on here, as well as kind of open science, which is a bit even further upstream from, from the actual principles, trying to put some of these principles into practice. Um, so maybe, um, maybe Chris, if you want to outline just what, what are these fair data principles and, and and what's the relation with this this open science movement sure sure yeah this is a really interesting question i mean you could see that they're both like the open science movement is mostly a social movement right it's how we ought to be doing things as scientists right whereas the fair data principles is more of a mandate on the infrastructure on which we share our discoveries right hmm. so it's how we off to implement technologies to make the, the fruits of the scientific pursuit interoperable and reusable, right? But they're closely interlinked because the practices that are best practices in open science, for example, sharing your code, sharing your data, all the pioneering work that groups like OSF, the Open Science Framework, have been doing, right? All this pioneering work, all of this needs to be connected on a technological infrastructure that provides the affordances that are mandated by the fair principles, right? So that's a way to look at, to, to, they are, they are two, essentially two faces of, a different, of the same coin, but they address different levels. One is social and normative, and the other one is infra infrastructural and technological. Yeah. Yep, and uh, so and, uh, just yeah. to be very clear about this, so what, what open science means is basically um, practices around making science openly accessible. So this refers to the final manuscript, which in the vast majority of cases nowadays is still hidden behind the paywall of a journal. Um, this is changing right now. So more and more journals are actually uh, now open access. So instead of having a, a subscription fee, you now pay an author publication charge to, uh, uh, to basically get your work published there. So there's a growing number of, uh, uh, of open access journals. Uh, and a lot of work is being made, uh, you know, accessible that way, uh, which, by the way, has a bunch of negative side effects as well, because it, it, it basically creates this weird incentive for journals to uh, accept as many articles as they possibly can, because mm. rejecting one basically means that you're foregoing revenue. And right, this also right. led to the emergence of a lot of, um, you know, fake journals uh, that are literally just you know, making money by printing non-scientific studies. Um, yeah. But so the open science movement, so it started with just making the articles available, but then it went uh, on and it said, okay, so let's also make the data available. Let's make the code available. And they, they started to become very much aware of this replication issue and started to think about what we can do about that. And, and things that emerged out of that were ideas like pre-registering your analysis plan or submitting your analysis plan to a journal where it is then 
uh, evaluated and uh, you basically, if, if the referees and the editors like the research question you're asking and your design, they would basically give you a guarantee to publish your article irrespective of what the results would be if you just stick to that protocol. So there is a lot of like meta science innovations that came out of this open science movement and it's been gaining a lot of um, traction over the years which has been enormously helpful and positive for the for the academic community overall. Uh, and as, said, uh, as, as Chris said, so it, it really also changed uh, the culture uh, and the norms in science. And the FAIR yeah. movement, uh, just to unpack that, so FAIR is an acronym, a very clever acronym that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. Hmm. And... It is basically, it's it's a number of uh, propositions or, or mandates uh, that lay out specific technical uh, requirements that, that need to be fulfilled uh, to have fair data. And it turns out that in the vast majority of cases, this is all about metadata rather than the data itself. And this is about machine actionability. So these are the two major themes of the uh, of the fair movement and, and what they're trying to do. So they're, they're basically trying to make data as accessible as possible uh, and uh, to make it findable and interoperable and reusable, machines need to be able to understand what that data set is. And that is actually not that easy. And there is a lot of work and, and research that goes into uh, like how do we actually make data fair? It's non-trivial. Yeah, and I think by data also, it's I think we're not just talking about research data. I think it's important to note we're talking about the fruits of the scientific pursuit, right? Whether it's a manuscript, whether it's data, whether it's research code, whether it's a video, what have you, right? All of these scientific outputs, right? Got it, got it. So, and so I think th this is why I, I really like what you guys are doing from uh, kind of like the kind of roping this, conver this, into the, roping this conversation into the kind of the Web3 crypto angle here. Right, exactly. Um, I think what I, what I really like about what you guys are doing is that there's there's uh, there's like a clear sort of problem that you're that's that's widely acknowledged that you're, you're looking to solve. This isn't like one of these solution in search of a problem type of things that we see so much in crypto. <laughs> um, but this is. There, there's a it's pretty well acknowledged and well documented what you guys are trying to solve for. Um, maybe let, let's dive into like what are the technological limitations of doing of implementing like fair data mm -hmm. these fair data standards just using like a standard web two tech stack like why can't we just use the existing technologies for this? Yeah, maybe yeah, I'm gonna kick it off and then uh, Chris can uh, can jump in. That's so, only requires a bit of okay okay go for it Philip. Yeah. So the major problem that, that we have with the current internet infrastructure is that we, at least from the perspective of the scientific record, the major problem is that we do not have truly persistent identifiers. So the way that we're addressing data on the internet is with the URL that basically points to where a file is stored, but it doesn't tell us what that file is. And the result is that uh, if for whatever reason you move that data around on the server, the link breaks. So that's the problem of link rot. Or the link may still work, but the content itself may have changed. And that's the problem of content drift. And both of them are really essential problems for the integrity of the scientific record. And there is there is an attempt that the publishers made, um, I think, about 20 years ago to fix that problem. They introduced a, a system called the DOIs. Uh, so that's an attempt to basically come up with a persistent identifier for the uh, um, for the current internet. So it's basically a registration agency where the publisher is sending in their URL where the where the paper is being published, and then they're being assigned uh, a number, this DOI number, which is supposed to point always to uh, the correct uh, URL where you can find the article. Uh, in practice, unfortunately. Uh, the problems of link rot and content drift have not been resolved. Uh, the vast majority of references that you find in the scientific literature, they are affected by link rot and, and content drift. And even if you just look at uh, papers that are just, um, you know, uh, that making that are making references uh, to internet sources that are just three years old, already 50% of them are affected by either link rot or content drift. And when they're older than 10 years, uh, 
like these URLs are basically worthless. And the DOI, the DOI is they're also only a very partial solution to the problem. So about half of them, they do not correctly resolve to their target resource. And they also do not resolve persistently and uniquely to a target resource. So uh, this is basically, they, they've been trying to come up with a, with a patch uh, for, that, for that big, big problem. And now we have, with the decentralized web, we have a completely new and much more elegant solution to the problem, which is this concept of content address storage. So in a content address storage, basically what you have is a cryptographic hash function that takes any type of uh, content uh, input that you give it, and it converts it into a string of a particular length. And there's a lot of different ways how you can do that, but the really good algorithms, they basically guarantee that the hash that you're getting is going to be unique. So you can actually run the content that you downloaded from, uh, from such a, a content address through this hash function to double check if the content that you wanted is actually the one that you got. And it also means that we now have a completely new paradigm for storing data because with the content address, you can now have multiple copies of the same content being stored by different storage providers, uh, by, by different servers uh, in different uh, countries and, and different uh, continents. And they're going to be identical. And the resolver is just going to give you access to, uh, to the version that, uh, that is immediately available or that is uh, most convenient. So that resolves so many problems. Uh, and it is, it is a really, really fundamental building block for making the scientific record um, accessible and fair in the long term, because it really depends on us being able to have persistent identifiers. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, persistent identifiers, that's a bit of a strange word, right? But it touches on something that's fundamental, fundamental, right? This is essentially your entry. What does it mean to be part of the scientific record, right? That's a really interesting question. What makes a piece of science count? Ha, huh. right? Um, <laughs> think about it this way. Every manuscript, it's like, a, you know, some PDF or some Word document, you submit it to a journal, they do all the work. On the scientist side, you don't really see this, right? You go through the peer review process, comes out. But you just know one thing. You know that it's going to count for that next grant application or the hiring committee you're about to face for your tenure committee in two years, right? But why does it count, right? Well, because it's been published in a prestigious journal in your field. Fair enough. But what does that mean technologically? What is the substrate of this, right? Well, essentially, you have, this is what happens. You have a publisher silo, which essentially processes your document. The entire scientometric machine is a document processing pipeline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it essentially links that document with a persistent identifier, which is a key, a global key to that knowledge, right? It's an, also an actionable key. Why? Because you can click on that persistent identifier and it will redirect you to the server of the publisher storing your work through a URL to PID uh, uh, key value map, right? That is a centralized lookup table. Mm -hmm. The effect of that is that you have registration agencies like Crossref, who in addition to registering a PID also register what journal has been published in, when it's been published, who are the authors and all of the so-called bibliometric information, right? Mm -hmm. And they charge you for it, of course. And they charge you for it, right? Now, <laughs> the issue about this is that now you have pub content publishers, scholarly communication content publishers, who have to maintain records of millions upon millions of URL to PIDs. And that rots inevitably. Crossref runs crawlers to essentially alert publishers every time something breaks. Mm -hmm. And it break very often every database migration, every MA, all of these mm -hmm. movements within the scientific ecosystem, the scientific publishing ecosystem leads to drift or link rot, right? And so it's very hard to scale. And now imagine, so the, the, the DOIs, there's I think 275 million DOIs. When you think about it, and this is again, something from the fair data principles, every digital object should have a persistent identifier. Mm -hmm. Your typical computational workflow for a scientist in STEM today, if you were to publish all of your data and all of your code, would result in thousands, if not tens of thousands of digital objects. Mm -hmm. What's the state of the art today? You get one DOI for all of these digital objects. Mm -hmm. 
That doesn't work. They're not even versionable. You can't version your data. You have no ability to do version control over the fruits of the scientific record, just like we have with code. And that's insane. That's completely crazy. Um, the current system essentially maps a document to a PID to metadata from a registration agency, which is then harvested by the so-called scientific indexing databases. And that's a really, really important concept. What do we mean by that? These are the arbiters or the regulators of what is science and what is not science. And so you have at the very top of that, you have the web of science by Clarivate and Analytics that provides the impact factor and citation counting for the scientific record. This is what funders and hiring committees and people all over science use to make hiring decisions, to make grand decisions. And what do they see? They see an author linked with papers that have a citation count and an impact factor in the journals they publish. All of your open sciences practices, whether your work's reproducible, whether you've published your code, whether you've published your data, whether that data is being reused by your community, all of this is cast aside in an infrastructure that today is inappropriate for the needs of modern computational pipelines. And so you live in a system where the crystal ball on which funders and hiring committees are, are, are gazing to decide how to best allocate funds. They're feeding them information that is at best partial and at worst misleading them in their allocative decisions. And so that's what makes it count. When we say my paper counts, what does it mean? It means it's indexed by, uh, published by, by an indexer like the Web of Science or Scopus from Elsevier, right? Mm -hmm. Because those are the systems that feed analytics to the people that pay your salary at the end of the day. So, and this is why there's tremendous dependency in that entire chain, which again consists of a document processing pipeline, a publisher silo, a DOI schema and system, a registration agency, and at the very top, a scientific indexer who then feeds that analytics to the people that make decisions about your future about it as a scientist. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. So, so there's essentially this like monolithic kind of bureaucracy that's just been created here. And it, it feels like one of these things where there's perhaps there's just as technology advances, as new problems arise, there's kind of new, like kind of layers and band-aids and things being slapped onto it to try to patch the system together. And what you guys are trying to do is basically build sort of a workaround to that, uh, essentially. Um, but, it's not I mean, just a workaround. It's like well, it's not just a workaround. Like, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a whole, it's like a whole new, like a whole new, exactly. a whole new concept. Yeah. Just, it's entirely rethinking everything from first principles and like building everything from from the ground up. Exactly. It's, it's the before, idea of before, you know, before yeah, we get into no. before we get into really what what you guys are doing in particular. Like, I mean, just coming back with a criticism here or potential pushback of, I mean, okay, like maybe this the this system of current science is. You know, maybe there is a lot of uh, it doesn't work very well. There's some 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 broken pieces uh, here and there, uh, but look at look at the the progress that humanity has made on the scientific front in the last 40, 50 years. I mean, it's been pretty impressive, right? So, I mean, the system may not be perfect, but it seems to be working pretty well. I mean, at least in the Are eyes you sure of it. About uh, that? Are you sure? Well, that I mean, maybe after this conversation today, no. But, <laughs> but, but, but I mean, you know, I'm like, I mean questions, right? What are what is what is the celebrated breakthrough in psychology that we've achieved in the last 30 years? <laughs> there was a Twitter thread about that from uh, uh, Bloom, a very you know, influential devel developmental psychologist at Stanford. And people in I was the, a psychology major in college, and I, I don't know the answer yeah. to this. And, and, and what is the paradigmatic <laughs> improvement we've created, right? And there's a big silence, a big void. So I, I think we, we have to be mindful, you know, when we talk about, well, look, you know, how much the world has advanced. We don't have a control group with an alternative scientometric machinery yeah. doing that conclusion against, right? We yeah. just have what the system says. And I think, actually, my, my take is, is the opposite, is that the progress that we have today in science could have been so much more if mm. we spend time and resources on meta-scientific improvements to the mm -hmm. immense scientometric machinery that scientists face in their daily lives. But we haven't. And the reason why we haven't is that it's an incredibly complex system with a lot of stakeholders with all sorts of different incentives, right? And so it's a very difficult system to tweak because the level of ossification of that system 
is, 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 is quite frankly tremendous, right? Mm. Uh, but let's take a counterexample here. Now, you said, well, there's this tremendous progress happening in the world. And you might be thinking about AI and machine learning, you know, and fair enough. Yes. Why? Why? AI, AI as a field was relying on papers and papers and papers published in archive for like decades. And then something happened. They started to value artifacts. They started to value your model. They started systems like papers and code where you'd post your code alongside your paper. Then you, we had Hugging Face, which made artifacts reusable in a, in, a, in, in, in a tremendously accelerated way. And so all of a sudden, we've created an infrastructure that had a downstream effect on the norms of a scientific community. And from these downstream effects, what happened is that what was valued by the scientific community started to change slowly but surely to the point that now we have these composable models that people can build upon and provide improvements with common benchmark and all sorts of like advanced systems that, that are born out of it, right? So I think it's really, really important to think about the role of infrastructure in how these fields have been leading us to breakthroughs. And yeah, my take on that is that science has not been progressing nearly as fast as it should have been progressing. And this is not, this is extremely manifest when you look at a problem like Alzheimer research, right? Billions of billions of dollars poured into the, um, the beta amyloid hypothesis as the causative factor for Alzheimer research. Yeah. Billions of dollars resulting yeah. in 15,000 PDFs and an entire yeah, house yeah. of cards that is crumbling before our eyes. Why? Yeah. No, and this is this is an interesting point. I mean, there was uh, I mean, not to turn this conversation like political in any way, but I just saw there was with Vivek Ramaswamy, who's one of the he's like a uh, you know this guy running for president. He was a, like a biotech executive, biotech founder, uh, and he had taken some criticism over uh, some sort of like failed Alzheimer's drug he was trying to develop. And his response was like, "Look, like literally like ninety nine point nine percent of like Alzheimer's drugs that are are tested like fail, right? Like we haven't figured this out yet." And just thinking of like how many like just billions and billions of dollars been poured into this stuff. And like, we yeah. still don't have any solution. Um, maybe there's incremental improvements with some of these drugs, uh, but like, we still don't have a solution to this. And it's been widely known and acknowledged for, for a long time that this is like, there's, there's no shortage of resources going into this, but we have nothing to show for it really. So actually this, this uh, beta amyloid example is, is a wonderful example for what's wrong with our infrastructure and for our incentives. Right. So the, the paper, uh, which which basically claimed that uh, beta amyloids are playing a causal role in the development of Alzheimer's that was published in Nature in 2006. And only last year did it actually come out that this paper was based on manipulated fraudulent images. So this could have been found out oh much, gosh. much earlier if people would have had access to the to the raw images, to the raw data. This would have been much, much easier to check. And it also would have been much easier to see that there is a problem if there would have been sufficient incentives for scientists to independently replicate that study. That didn't happen. So instead, what happened was that uh, like thousands of researchers from around the globe, they started making like little tweaks on that uh, hypothesis. And they built on that hypothesis, assuming that it's true, to develop drug treatments. So all that money was being poured into, uh, you know, developing treatments for, for this particular compound, which ultimately turned out not to be the causal reason for Alzheimer's. So it, it's just, it's... It's a very, very sad and very powerful illustration of the problems that we're facing in science. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, well, with that, I think we've, we've done a pretty good job outlining some of the problems here um, and with the problems of the current system. And, and, and I think you guys have done a pretty good job even explaining how the value proposition of, of the decentralized web and of tools like IPFS and Filecoin for, for persistent identifiers and for, and for even the story. We can actually talk about a bit with the storage angle as well. Uh, if you'd like, but let's, let's dive into just, you know, specifically what, what DSI labs is doing, like what, you know, you're not just trying to build a workaround here. You're trying to reinvent how we think about science, how we, how we create these incentives, uh, how we approach research. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's hear the, let's hear the pitch. Who wants to do it? <laughs> okay. I'll, 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 I'll buy it. I'll buy it. So, yeah. So, so, so we're, we're, we're re-envisioning, um, uh, scientific infrastructure for publishing, 
right, for, for, for putting our discoveries out there. And what does that mean? That means building infrastructure from the ground up that allows for reproducible research. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that infrastructure needs to be able to publish data sets, code, all sorts of artifacts with a, a, in, in a fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable way, right? So you can think about that as a completely open protocol built on the, the, with the core technologies of the decentralized web that interfaces right, with the scientific system and the daily practices of scientists. Right? So this is really the core idea is that we have now the technological primitives on which we can create what could become a game changer, an open science cloud where artifacts, where science is verifiable, where artifacts are reusable, where norms begin to evolve because we make things possible in a way that they weren't possible before. So that's the yeah. idea. That's what DSA Labs is building. So, on a, so to make it very concrete, so at the moment, what we're doing is basically we're working on, on two different things. One of them is what we call the DPID protocol. So that's, a, that's basically a completely public good. It's open source software, uh, which basically is there to create decentralized persistent identifiers uh, for research objects. And maybe Chris can talk a little bit more about how this really works, but this DPID protocol ultimately uh, is built on this concept of content of the storage and IPFS, and it turns it into a, basically a solution to a, a Zuko's triangle and the trilemma that it brings about. Which So Zuko was this computer scientist who, uh, uh, who basically established three desirable norms that identifiers should have. They should be secure, they should be uh, decentralized, and they should be human meaningful. Now, in contrast, the DOI system are none of these things. Uh, but Zuko basically said you have to pick two out of three. And um, the famous Aaron Schwartz, he came in 10, 10 years later, and he basically said, well, theoretically, it's possible to have all three. And the DPID protocol is actually a solution to this. So it's decentralized. It's built on, uh, on the IPS, uh, IPS protocol. It is uh, highly secure. You cannot manipulate it. Uh, and it is also human meaningful. So we took these hashes and we're basically uh, converting them into much, much shorter addresses that have meaning and interpretation uh, for humans. And with these DPIDs, we can now basically describe the data structure of a research object. So what's a research object? The research object is basically a, a connection of digital artifacts that are uh, representing a particular research project. So this could be a manuscript, it could be a data set, it could be a code file, it could be a video, it could be anything. It could also be thousands of these things, right? And a research object links all of them together, basically gives them a unique ID that says, well, this particular research object uh, has this particular name and you can find it here. And then it basically takes all of the components and also gives them unique identifiers. And uh, so you basically end up with this, uh, with this nice tree structure where all the components are ultimately linked to the root node of, the, of that research object. And you can update this thing so it's versionable. So if you go in and let's say you post a new data set or you update your manuscript, you're not overriding anything. You're literally just creating a new version of the, of the research object, which will then be indexed on a blockchain where we're then going to publicly announce and say, well, for this particular research object, now the newest version is X and clicking on X will take you to that newest version. And it has been created by Y at a particular uh, point in time, right? And with it, that DPID protocol, we can also enable a bunch of really, really cool new features that didn't exist before. So one of them is that these DPIDs ultimately function very similar to, a, to an irrevocable API that allows you to, uh, to interact with these research objects, right? So a, a human could, for example, use those DPIDs to very, very... Uh, quickly and easily import a data set or a, a code file or whatever from a particular version of a research object programmatically into their local compute workflow. Just one, one uh, command in Python and you import that stuff, right? So huge improvement in, uh, uh, in workflow. Also, these DPIDs, they're actually ultimately owned by their authors. 
uh, they're permissionless. Anybody can create them. It's, uh, it's an open source software. It doesn't cost you anything. But if you create one, it's yours. Um, and then you can also use that to send compute jobs to data, right? So because it's a persistent identifier, you can now actually, you don't have to download the data to do something with it. You can actually start performing compute jobs on the servers where the data is already stored, which uh, enables a couple of things. So one of them is it, it basically makes it much easier to reproduce research, but it's also a huge advantage when you have very, very large data sets that you don't want to move around because it costs too much time and too much money. So instead, you just send a compute job to the server where the data already lives and you, you exercise it there. And another thing is we can actually use these DPIDs to send so-called attestations to research objects. So what's an attestation? That's that's basically, that's a way how we... Um, how we evaluate research, right? So, and, and we're in the process right now of like really nailing down conceptually what this means and how we translate into, in, into a user experience. But think of it uh, as things such as saying data is available, code is available. Somebody has actually checked that the results that you're reporting in this, res uh, in this paper can actually be reproduced by the data and the code that you made available. So that may be an attestation. It may be an attestation that says, well, this is computationally uh, reproducible. And these sort of attestations, um, they're basically markers that you can send to these research objects. They're like a badge, right? So I can give you a badge. I can, I, I, I know that you're Aaron. I know where you, where you are, so I can give you a badge. And that's literally what that DPID protocol enables. So it, it also, it, it doesn't only solve this issue of like having persistent identifiers and, and fair data, it also enables completely new ways uh, to, um, to interact with research and to evaluate and to incentivize research. And that's the first thing that we're doing, like this open protocol uh, that is irrevocably out there uh, that anybody can build upon, anybody can contribute to. Uh, and on top of that, we have a user interface, a web-based user interface that we call Design Nodes, uh, which is also an open source software. And that uh, software allows you to create these research objects and to read them and to interact with them. So these are basically the two major things that, that we're working on at the moment. Got it, yeah. got it. A couple of things there I'd just like to double click on quickly that I, I think are, are quite interesting. I guess the, the first would be uh, kind of, so assuming that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm like a, a researcher who wants to replicate a study that that you the two of you have put out right and you've the the data and your your metadata and everything is all stored on these uh on, with these dpids or it's all indexed using these dpids and it's stored open you know, in the open like what would the process look like for me as a uh someone who's looking to replicate that study like what would like how would this be been a, 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 an improvement over the existing system i guess well the first thing is that the data and the code are actually available right? okay that's, <laughs> that's a good start years, right? good start I <laughs> First years of my PhD study, try, trying to replicate a study, I didn't have access to the data or the code. I had to rebuild everything myself mm. on my own, right? Because it was lost since the postdoc left, right? Essentially, which is a very mm. common story. The first step is re this is really like you, you might think of it as a low hanging fruit, but it's not. <laughs> it's like, can I, in, is, are, are the artifacts that made these results possible? Can I, can I, can I check them, right? And the next question you might ask yourself is like, well, how easy is it? And we're, what we're doing is we are essentially taking some of the learnings from Hugging Face, which have really pioneered this idea of creating interoperability around research artifacts and building this into what we call the PID as API model, where you can programmatically, I can, I can just go in my IDE and I can type Imagine if you could type, you know, for, uh, import DOI from DOI, import data set two, right? And give me its metadata. Well, this would never be possible with the current scholarly infrastructure. DPIDs enable that function. So that means as a scientist, and I'm, I don't care about the tech. I really don't care. I just care about whether it speeds my work up and it actually gives me advantages, right? And I can do the good thing. And so I can start to egress these resources out programmatically using common libraries in a single line of, of Python or MATLAB or what have you, right? And so I can start interacting with these artifacts live in a way that's extremely convenient, convenient for me. So this is a giant UX win. And, you know, PIDs, the original PIDs, the DOIs, they were made 
for publishers to manage copyright and to prevent mm -hmm. change in URLs through, because of MNAs. The PID system of tomorrow has the researcher's interests first in mind. The question mm -hmm. is, what does it do for me? How can it improve my workflows? How can it make, increase the pace of discovery of my group and my research lab, right? And this is how we're really thinking about PIDs. So to sum up, this vision of creating this open science cloud is essentially this proposition. Let's take that's the, the artifacts we published today. These papers, this document processing pipeline, all of these things we have scattered around GitHub, Zenodo, what have you. And let's combine this into a coherent unit of knowledge that becomes a computational object in itself. And I think that's a very powerful proposition. And it's yep. doable with the technologies that we have today. It just needs to be put up together. And just to add to that, so there, there is a really nice feature in the Design Notes app where as an author, you can basically connect your manuscripts to the underlying artifacts, right? So you, you could do things like, for example, you have typically you have figures and tables that are presenting the main results of your of your study. So what you can do in that app is you can you can go to table one or to figure one, and you can directly link it to the data and the code uh, that you used for generating these results which makes it super, super easy for others to actually check these results because you're literally pointing them to the original resources. And then it's so much easier for you to understand what has been going on and you can easily rerun the analysis and double check if what you're getting is actually what they reported. Yep, and you and can't then, do this now. Have you ever asked yourself why we still use reference managers that say, <laughs> oh, this is the title, these are the authors, this is the year it's been published in volume six, issue seven, of the journals of X, right? And then we have a DOI link underneath. Why do we do this? Well, we don't trust DOIs, right? That's the reason. Like we, we the, the whole web runs on hyperlink. The scientific record runs on reference management because the problem of quantum drift and link growth is so acute. Yeah, and also I wanted to double click on this earlier, actually, the, the issue of content drift and link rot. And this is something that at, at fi in Filecoin land, we talk about this quite a bit as it's one of the use yeah. cases or it's one of the problems that we solve. And it's this is another one of these issues that for a lot of people, it just it feels like kind of maybe like it's just a trivial thing, right? It's like, oh, my picture of my cat on, you know, I had on Google Drive, like the link doesn't work anymore because it, you know, disappeared, whatever, like big deal. But then when you realize how pervasive these problems is, mm -hmm. are, are not just in science, but just across the web generally, yep. Um, yep. you know, I think there's some sort of stat about how like, you know, like 50% of the links cited in Supreme court decisions or something are all just like dead links or you know, yes, exactly. crazy stuff like that. <laughs> and you're like, Whoa, that's, that's kind of a big deal, you know? Uh -huh. Um, and, and so really solving for those issues, um, and just when you're in this, this framing of just knowledge management, how do you actually keep, you know, maintain this open science cloud of it, or this, this sort of repository of information in a way that's, that's persistent and reliable, and 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 is is findable and accessible right is is such a is such a major it's a it's a it's just a it's a core sort of flaw of like of, of our current internet infrastructure yeah. right this, this hyperlink based system um one other angle i wanted to tap into was kind of going back tie, tying this back to our earlier talk about uh about just incentives right mm -hmm. and so for for a, a scientist who's sort of caught in the rat race of you know big science publishing you know pumping out papers and journals or whatever like what would be the, the the financial like what what would be the incentive for them to start adopting something like this when their their current uh, you know funding is sort of uh, you know based on on sort of you know the current system and and, and just doing as well as they can in the current uh, broken system. Yeah. So to be very clear, I mean the the direct incentives for going the extra mile and to make all your data and code available and to make your work fully reproducible. So that takes a lot of effort and and it also takes a bit of guts. It, it actually means that you're exposing yourself. It means that you're making yourself vulnerable. Other people can check what what mistakes you made. You may embarrass yourself, and the incentives for doing that uh, are at the moment either very very small or non-existent. However, however, we actually think that if you do all of these things, if you actually make your work fully reproducible, if you actually expose yourself that way uh, and you're doing it the right way, that you can actually increase your chance of getting published into one of these glam journals that you care about. 
So this is actually a hypothesis that we uh, that we want to test with a with a field experiment that we're thinking about uh, setting up very soon. Uh, but so that would be a very reasonable hypothesis, right? So that that editors and uh, and and referees are actually going to feel so much more comfortable about the work that you're showing them if they can actually double check everything and reproduce everything and really understand what you've been doing. Then they can also much easier figure out what the actual problems are. So in some cases, that may mean that you're gonna get rejected, but then at least you're gonna get rejected probably for a good reason. Uh, instead of, you know, for not being novel enough or, you know, not having chosen the right words or whatever. Um, but it may ultimately help you if you're doing things right uh, to, uh, to just publish in the journals that you really care about uh, and basically establish yourself as a leader in open science, somebody who embraces best practices, who establishes best practices, uh, and who then can also be visible for doing that uh, and get rewarded for that. Yes, and I think that's the that's the short term. the The medium term, though, is is really interesting, right? It's it's all about this idea of attestation. Mm -hmm. And so now, if you look at the U.S., for instance, there's a lot of reformation movements happening around hiring committees, where people are looking for evidence of open science best practices. Hmm. And it's not just them; it's also funders who are moving in that direction. Yep, absolutely. The problem is they have no ways, as I said, you know, with the analogy of the crystal ball and the web of science. <laughs> They have no ways of checking any of this, right? So what if, what if, right, we had these badges that says your data available, your code's available. These are the same type of, 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 of essentially, that was pioneered by the open science uh, uh, framework, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very popular with authors. It's popular with editors. It's popular with everyone, but it's conspicuously absent from the scientific, scientometric machinery's uh, internal systems, mm -hmm. right? So they end up as like, Stamps on a web page. I mean, what is this worth? Not much. We can change that. We can make it that when you attest to the verified nature of an attestation on a research object that says this work is end-to-end -end computationally reproducible, that attestation has been signed by a DID, has been signed by an issuer who has the legitimacy to provide that attestation that you can check. And you can now have a machine-actionable uh, digital object that you can return so that it can be indexed and moreover that we can push into your ORCID record. So if you don't know what's ORCID, it's an identity solution, <laughs> right? Yeah. So essentially when you build out these, these research objects that are internally reproducible, your CV gets beefed up. Mm -hmm. Your CV starts having open science best practice, boom, fully reproducible work. And it just keeps going. Right. And all of a Got sudden, it. You have a direct link between the things that matter for your career as a scientist who ultimately depends on the, 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 your institutions and these funders to show what you've been doing, right? And so that's really one of the core, and I think one of the really, really interesting things that could happen in the medium term as adoption picks up around these systems. And I think whether it's us or someone else that does it, it needs to happen. It's fundamental. So it's really a question of, uh, of, of from the individual scientist's uh, vantage point and incentive structure. It's really kind of a question of skating to where the puck is going, right? Where you see all this momentum within the community. Uh, a lot of funders and a lot of even governments are even like pushing for these types of like like if you're gonna if you want get a, get a grant from us, like you need to have you need to be adopting these exactly. kind of open these fair principles, yep. um, this openness movement. So it, it's really a question of 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 like. Maybe it became maybe in the immediate term, like there is no necessarily like immediate financial reward for me for doing this. But over the course of my career, like this is really like I'm going to be building up my reputation by yep. by 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 embracing this and um and, exactly. and building up my own credibility and 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 whatnot. So I, I think it's it's uh yeah, like if, if it's not you guys, it's gonna be somebody else who's gonna to have to come up with this, uh, this type of solution, essentially. Um and maybe just to kind of wrap up here, um, I want to just touch a bit more on like why um, like Filecoin, the Filecoin IPFS tech stack is such a, like a unique, I mean, it mm -hmm. almost like, it almost like fits like a glove to like the problems you guys are trying to solve, right? It's, it like, it's almost, it's almost like, um, it, you know, so, I mean, this is, given that this is like a Filecoin foundation sponsored podcast, um, exactly. you know, or hosted podcast. Uh, I'd love for you to just articulate, uh, whoever wants to take this one or both of you, if you want, 
Uh, but why is the Filecoin IPFS tech stack like such uh, like an ideal fit for like what you guys are trying to do? So, okay, maybe I'm going to start this off. So I remember talking to uh, to Juan Vinay, sort of the, the founder of uh, IPFS and Filecoin. Like first time we met him, he actually told us that back in the early days when he had this first idea about IPFS, that he literally wanted to build a, a better system to store humanity's most valuable data. So for science, he was literally thinking about creating a better way to make science available and to store it, right? And, and yeah, so that's that's really what we're building upon. It's, it's this pioneering work that you guys have been doing for many, many years. So IPFS really, the, the superpower there is content addressing. Uh, this is really what, what we're building on. Very, very crucial. Firecoin provides this incentive layer on, on top of it. And it, it has this, this beautiful property that it basically incentivizes storage providers for uh, basically making archival copies uh, available and rewarding them for, for doing that reliably. And, uh, and the system is built in a way that if you put in like valuable scientific data, that you actually need to have multiple copies of that stored by different storage providers in, in different countries and different continents, right? So, and that is enormously, enormously important and powerful concept because many copies keep things safe. And it's also a built-in architectural guarantee against vendor lock-in, against uh, content paywalls, uh, against get data silos, all of these things that are currently at at the root of the problems that we uh, that we have also in in the business models that uh, that exist in science, they're basically getting fixed by that. And uh, and for creating these archival copies, so we, when we put these data on on the Filecoin network, we create uh, you know basically data redundancy. So we, we have these multiple copies. But we're doing it with an archival copy, which actually, so that's interesting. So it has a disadvantage and an advantage. So the, the disadvantage is that it takes much longer to actually access the data. So in our protocol, there's also going to be an opportunity for, for people to have hot storage so they, they can actually choose and you can actually sponsor hot storage and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, if you just have an archival copy, which is actually going to be sufficient for the for the vast majority of scientific data, because most of it actually doesn't get used very often, you just want to make sure that if you want to access it, that it's still there and you can still find it, right? And and then it has this beautiful advantage that storing it cold is so much cheaper. It is an enormous cost reduction, and it also means that you use less energy for storing it, right? So it, uh, for the vast majority of scientific data, we can actually save energy costs by putting it into archival storage, and we're going to be totally fine. And IPFS and Filecoin are really, really convincing good solutions for that. Yeah, it's well said. Well said. Um, it, yeah, it, it it feels like it's almost like the perfect ideal use case, and that you did bring it back to like you know when you first met Juan, and this was actually what he was his original vision for of what he's trying to build. It all kind of it all kind of ties back together. So that's, uh, <laughs> exactly. that's super super helpful. Yeah, it's like wow, that, that's 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 quite useful. Um, but anyway, um, we should probably wrap up here. But um, you know, like uh, for for the people listening here, you know that are uh, in the Filecoin ecosystem, I think the use case for archival storage is vastly underrated. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. science, it is a huge deal to be able to archive your data for the long term. It is a huge deal because we now have the OSTP memo that mandates that all the fruits of research need to be made available freely and archived over you know long periods of time. And sorry, sorry, the USTP, what is this? this is a memo from the White House Office of Technology that says there's no more embargo on scientific manuscripts that are peer reviewed. And all of the data that has been accompanied, that, that accompanied this needs to be published and made freely available, right? And so the, the, this is like, we, we were collaborating with a fantastic group of scientists at the University of Columbia on, on a breakthrough in fluid dynamics. And, and they just happened to have 200 terabytes of raw data. Like this is the type of data that is perfectly suited for long-term archival because it may be useful, but it's not useful all the time. It's not the type of data that you need to have available all the time over your network. And, the, 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 and it's also 200 gigabytes of process data, which allows you to reproduce all the results. 
And so these types of solutions, I think, are going to, you know, there, there's, there's a tremendous need for high quality, trustable, verifiable storage solution for archival that is extraordinarily cost effective. Amazing. Yeah. And that's definitely the file coin kind of like that's our meat and potatoes right now. Right. And that's the, 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 the value proposition that we can bring right now, which is great. Um, and um, yeah, so with that, we'd love to just maybe get like a quick final thought from each of you. And uh, if folks want to get in touch for whatever reason, want to work on help, help you guys out, want to work on whatever with you guys, uh, what's the best way to get in touch? I think probably the, the easiest way is uh, to, uh, you know, find us on Twitter, um, DSI Labs or the DSI Foundation or on the internet. Um, that's very easy. And I just want to give a shout out. So we're actually running the Future of Science podcast and seminar series in the, uh, in the DSI Foundation. And uh, we're about to kick off our second season uh, oh, in amazing. September. And in the first season, we already uh, had amazing speakers. So Juan Benet was one of them. David Oronchik, who started the Bakayao project, was another one. We had fantastic conversations there. We learned a lot from the people that we were talking to. And we're really looking forward to the second season. We're inviting everybody to join and to listen. Amazing. All right. Um, well, amazing. Uh, thanks uh, so much, Philip and Chris, for being here today. Uh, really great conversation. Uh, really learned a lot. And uh, best of luck on your project and your future podcasting careers as well. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I guess the old open science thing doesn't work out. You can be you can be uh, science influencers with your podcast. <laughs> anyway, uh, but anyway, really appreciate your time. Great having you here. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. And we'll see you on the next episode of D Web Decoded.